Hey readers, stick around after today's episode for our very special conversation with Lisa Genova, author of Still Alice. It'll be a bonus episode. Enjoy. An indomitable enemy. It holds you captive in your body as it eats away at your mind. It abducts those you love the most, leaving you alone until even the person in the mirror becomes a stranger. Until it stops your mind, your heart, it is relentless. That enemy is Alzheimer's disease, and one brilliant woman is blindsided when having to face it too soon at an age too young. The woman's name is Alice. The book is Still Alice by Lisa Genova, and you're listening to Lit Society. Let's, Let's get, get lit. Let's get lit. Mm-hmm. Let's do that. Woo! Hey y'all. Hey, this is Kari. And this is Alexis. Hey Kari, I like that voice. <laughs> <laughs> and you're listening oh. to Lit Society WBZ. Just kidding. Okay, we wish. Uh, you listen to Lit Society. Radio voice. A podcast about books and drama. Alexis. You yes. look great. <laughs> you're kind. Thank you. Anything <laughs> exciting going on with you? Can I tell you about the um, great time I had on Saturday? Please. I had previous plans with my brother um, and he came into town and we did a um, a chicken hop. Ever heard of it? No. Okay. <laughs> That's because I invented the chicken hop. Okay. And you can imagine what a chicken hop is. Yeah. Can't you? Mm-hmm. you go to all the spots that got good chicken. That is exactly what we did. And we created, I created a rating sheet. Um, He was a little late. I'm going to call him out on that. He was late. So we didn't get to do all the things I wanted to do. Shout out to JJ. We got to hit four restaurants and taste test the chicken and assess it. And it was just a good time all around. I love that. That sounds like a, a beer crawl, but with chicken. Yes, and so we hop. <laughs> and you took it really, and you hop in between, so you work off the calories. I Absolutely. love it. I yeah. love it. I think I'm going to make it a, 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 a Airbnb excursion. <laughs> no, I think you should. That's the best scam. Do it. I hope you market it. I believe in that. <laughs> How about you? How's your week been? Um, it's been really great. I um, sang karaoke. With some friends at Lincoln Karaoke. If you're from Chicago, no doubt you know that place. Um, I haven't been there since COVID. So it was a great time. Um, and then I just finished a Peloton ride. Uh, um, two for one with Tunde and um, what's his name? Tucson. I, they do a great job. They're so cute. <laughs> they don't really ride with you and they don't know how to count. However, it was a great time. <laughs> They'd be like five, twenty, three, forty nine, and one. What I did see your post on uh, uh, Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's move on. <laughs> And now for our theme of the week. Listeners, if you're a long time listener or a short time listener, you know that each week we choose a theme to discuss based on the book we're reading. And this week, the theme is what you can do to avoid Alzheimer's disease. My source is the Harvard Health Publishing um, by Harvard Medical School. And this is a, a theme we touched on last week. Alexis handled mm-hmm. that really well. So I'm just going to try to add to it based on what this um, article found. And this article was created in cooperation with Dr. Gad Marshall, Associate Medical Director of Clinical Trials at the Center of Alzheimer's Research and Treatment at Harvard affiliate Brigham and Women's Hospital. So the credentials are there. Okay. I said Harvard like 50 times. Okay, so believe Harvard. It. <laughs> so how does Alzheimer's disease work? Alexis, you know this. It has to do with the amyloid beta, the buildup of amyloid beta in the brain. You went there with the science. I love it. Um, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, this is the most common form of dementia. And you're absolutely right. It's when that um, those proteins um, build up or accumulate on the brain. And there are two types of proteins, amyloid beta, 
and um, tangles, which is like tau. Anyway, oh. eventually it kills the brain cells and takes people's lives. Um, and doctors still aren't completely sure what causes it. However, a few healthy habits may help us to avoid it. Uh, number one, can you guess? Get some sleep. Oh, not quite. Exercise. Ooh. Exercise, yes. Also you know, exercise. Any disease exercise is going to help. I don't know what disease exercise wouldn't help. So there is evidence that an active lifestyle helps to prevent or slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And that's a great thing because that is something we can do. The recommendation is 30 minutes of moderately vigorous activity four days per week. Okay. So, you know, that's listening to Tune Day Count backwards and forwards at the same time, <laughs> four days per week. We can do okay. it. Number a minimum two, of 30 minutes, right? Th- yeah, thank you. A minimum of 30 minutes of, of that vigorous activity, four days a week. Number two, eat like a Greek. Even a moderate adherence to a Mediterranean diet may help. Eat fresh fruits and veggies, of course, whole grains, olive oil, nuts, legumes, fish, and moderate amounts of poultry, eggs, and dairy. Red wine and red meat only sparingly. Is that something you do right now? Uh, Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. But I eat pasta a oh, lot. Oh, yeah. And so Mediterranean mm-hmm. is more rice or a grain based diet, right? Yeah, more quote unquote clean eating. So pasta can be a form of clean eating, but it's um something that you create and process. It's not directly right. from the earth. Um so this does focus more on unprocessed even right. um even though you some times people make handmade pasta, but not that starchy type of uh, diet. So um number 3 to your point Sleep like Beyonce at a Jennifer Lopez concert. There is increasing (laughs) evidence that improved sleep (laughs) can help to prevent the disease. (laughs) Do you you know how much sleep we should aim for each night, Alexis? Seven to nine hours. You got it, girl. So I have here seven to eight, but that extra hour won't hurt you. Now, Mm -mm. who in the world got time to sleep that much? I mean, I would love it. (laughs) Oh, I would love to have that. I, I'm going to get back on that. I used to get seven, eight hours a night. Then I started trying to be responsible and get up at six o'clock. <laughs> no, still do that. We got to go to bed early. I know. I know. <laughs> and that's hard because when you're giving yeah. and giving all day long, you just got a little time that's just for you. And you might want to spend it watching Amazon Prime for four hours. But you can't. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't start that marathon. Don't Go start to it. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. Now I have a few more tips that may help, but honestly, there isn't a ton of evidence that suggests um, these are proven to work. But you know what? They won't hurt you and they're good habits to keep anyway. Number one, learn a new language or something else new. Because that con- cognitive stimulation, um, those activities may be helpful to just keep the brain going. Learning something new um, can help you avoid Alzheimer's, perhaps. And number two, connect socially. Yes, RSVP for that Zoom party. We know. What? Boring. Do it anyway. Be social. That's the answer. To, it's it takes effort. I don't it want does. there to be a before COVID when I had these friends and after COVID when I just let them go. Good people yeah. who added value to my life. So yeah. that's my goal this month. I've been asking a few friends like, hey, can we just get brunch or can we grab a coffee? Mm-hmm. It's the easiest thing to do. But those social connections also keeps your brain sharp. And then there's one quote that I want to state directly from my source, which I'll put in the show notes. And the quote says, know the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Forgetting where you parked your car can be annoying. If it happens all the time, it can be disturbing. And you may worry that it's a sign of a serious condition, but don't panic. There's a difference between normal age-related memory slips, such as forgetting where the car keys are, and more serious signs of memory loss, such as forgetting what car keys are used for. Now, this is exactly, when I read this, I said, hey! Hey, this is what Alexis said in our last episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to repeat that again. You know, don't freak out. It's something it's fine to forget. We all forget sometimes. Um, and that's just a part of life, you know. Yeah. But if you start forgetting like what these keys go to, 
then maybe talk to somebody, a neurologist. Mm-hmm. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The brain. Is there anything else you wanted to bring out? I know you did some extensive research on this subject. No, no, I'm glad um, you talked about it. Um, Lisa has a TED talk, and I think I mentioned this last week, where she has an image of the amyloid beta and the buildup of it and um, how sleep can reduce it because it's supposed to clean that out every night, the buildup of amyloid beta. And if it builds up too much, that is your um, body, your brain kind of moving towards that disease, toward dementia. Well, that's Mm -hmm. a great tip. Get some rest. All right. Well, then let's take a break and then we'll continue. Sounds good. All right. And we're back. Alexis, can you please give us some background on our author, Lisa Genova, and perhaps their motivation for Still Alice? This is fascinating, by the way. I'm so excited. All right. Lisa graduated from Harvard University with a Ph.D. in neuroscience. She started writing in 2004 following her divorce. Uh, Lisa has two TED Talks. Um, She's received a lot of recognition for her work. Her books are on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, She's written three novels and then a nonfiction book that we talked about last week, Remember, um, and she's not asking me if I remember. The book is called Remember. Oh, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Correct. Uh, Still Alice is Lisa's debut novel, and Woo! it was self-published in 2007. When it got popular, the book was acquired by Simon & Schuster and then published in January 2009 by Pocket Books. You see, self-publishing works, you guys. It does. This book was adapted into a film in 2014. Um, the book was on the New York Times bestseller list for 59 weeks. More than a year. The book was even adapted for the stage by the Looking Glass Theater Company here (gasps) in Chicago. What? Yeah, yeah. And I think it, um, I think it was in 2014. Man. Yeah. I can't Mm. believe I'm so late on this book, but it's. Right. Right. Lots of information out there. So. Yeah, that's about Lisa. And one of the things I did learn is that her grandmother had Alzheimer's. And is that what she started did... her passion for this subject? Yeah. And that is where I, I'm almost positive that's where her start began. Um, her grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at uh, 28. And so she did everything she could to understand the disease. So she I, she earned a PhD in neuroscience first and then wrote this book. That's incredible. Right. 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 Wow. So that's what I have. Do you have anything extra to share? No. Thank you for edifying us on Lisa Genova and her incredible story. Now, please, if you don't mind, provide us with a brief no spoiler synopsis of Still Alice. Okay, Alice is a 50 year old woman concerned about some recent memory lapses, which she attributes to menopause. Kari, who do you think would enjoy reading this book? Well, to answer that question, I'd like to read some of the blurbs from the inside jacket. Are you ready? Yep, yep, yep. Heartbreaking. So if that sounds like something you want to (laughs) read, then you may be interested in still Alice. And Alexis, what were your first thoughts of the book? (laughs) Okay, so let's say my sister and I were talking about memory for some reason, and I just can't remember the origin of the conversation. But she mentioned having you can't remember your discussion on memory. That come on, don't call me out on that. But yes, I can't. Girl, get your keys out the microwave. (laughs) It's justified. (laughs) It's justified. Anyway, so yeah, and so I that intrigued me because I always say I have a terrible memory, as I've said before. I don't do do well in the games, (laughs) right? So it's it's true. I I have a bad memory, and I think that's okay. Okay, Mm -hmm. perfectly fine. (laughs) 
Okay. All right, well, thank you. And now for a spoiler filled deep dive into Still Alice by Lisa Genova, please, Alexis, take it away. All right. Here we go. Like, so this story is told over a period starting in September 2003 to, I believe, September 2005. Lee Alice is at home with her husband and she can hear him moving around upstairs. She knows he is looking for something. She's just waiting for him to call her. He's going from room to room and then suddenly he calls her and her husband's name is John and he says that he's looking for his glasses. So she goes into the kitchen and she can see John's glasses right there on the kitchen countertop in plain view and she says to herself how can someone so smart a scientist not see what's right in front of them but Alice herself had been a victim of items hiding in plain sight but Mm. she hadn't admitted it and she hadn't involved him in the search she recalls how one time she was looking for her Blackberry charger and she couldn't find it anywhere, you know, all over the house. But then when she went to, she ended up going to the store to buy another one. And the next day she goes in her bedroom and she sees it, the charger plugged up into the wall. On her she, side where On her side of was. the bed. Mm-hmm. So she chalked that up to excessive multitasking, getting older and really being way too busy. Alice works a mile from home, uh, which is great. She works at Harvard University and she works at the same school as her husband, who is, I believe, is a biologist. Um, They used to walk to work together. They don't anymore because of their schedules. She's been traveling a lot for the summer and kind of living out of a a suitcase. She's had multiple speaking engagements, which is what she usually do does during the summer months. She's in Rome, New York, New Orleans, Miami. Alice loved public speaking. So she loved going out to the different um, being called out to speak and represent Harvard and do all these presentations. But one day she was at um, a presentation and it was a presentation that she'd given before. I mean, not exactly word for word, but she knows the presentation. Um, so one day she's at Stanford. She's given a presentation that she's familiar with. And about 40 minutes into her presentation, she gets stuck on a word and she abandons her thought and moves on. And she feels like this is taking forever. You've been there before where maybe for your sure. public speaking can't. Um, on you this can't podcast. think of a word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Real. And then you like, uh, but she looks at the audience and she feels like no one has noticed her hiccup, but she does notice that a colleague has his eyebrows furrowed and a slight smile on her face. Yeah, he's, he's a rival colleague. Yeah, yeah. But she doesn't remember it, the word, because she just puts in another word and moves on. But she doesn't remember the word until the plane is landing at LAX. And what was the word, Kari? Lexicon. Yeah. So LAX is where her, not LAX, LAX is an airport, (laughs) but her daughter lives in LA. And so she was going to her daughter, Lydia's apartment. Lydia seemed surprised to see Alice so early. Um, I guess there's a time miscommunication there. So Lydia goes ahead and sees if she they can get into their dinner appointment early and they can. Lydia's been living in LA for about three years. Alice says that Lydia is the smartest of her three children, but she didn't go to college. She, instead, she went to Europe and Alice felt like when, while she's in Europe, she'll be able to figure out exactly what she wants to do in school and get focused on her college goals. But what does uh, Lydia do instead, Kari? She like finds a boy and becomes an actress. Yeah, she wants to be an actress, much to Alice's chagrin, because she sees uh, not that her acting is a waste of time, but that this time period in her yes, life, that is a, she should it be, is a waste of time. <laughs> she should be focusing on 
um, college school and getting the education she needs so that later in life she'll have something to fall back on. As they're talking at dinner, they have drinks. Alice is hoping the drinks would lighten the mood and the tension. So Alice, <laughs> but it doesn't. It doesn't work that way at all. Alice asks, how did Lydia meet her roommates? Um, Lydia tells her. And a moment later, Alice asks the question again. Lydia spits out, I just told you. Why don't you ever listen to anything I say? So there's definitely tension between this mother and daughter team. Lydia is the youngest of her three children. The older two are actively engaged in their careers. One, the oldest child, Anna, is a uh, lawyer and the second oldest or the middle child is a biologist, I believe. As they talk, Alice again insists that Lydia should go to school, but Lydia is taking classes. Alice learns that John is paying for Lydia's schooling and that kind of ticks Alice off because she feels like John is doing this. Again, John is the husband behind her back. They haven't and talked Alice, about it. And Alice is in, in agreement with um, Lydia's choice of career and not going to school. So for John to be financing it, Alice is furious inside. Absolutely furious. Um, Alice believes that Lydia not going to college is reckless. And she really believes in having a formal education. I mean, what would happen if you got pregnant? What you going to do? They're dining. Somebody famous walks in. Alice does not know who it is. It is the Jennifer Anderson. And Lydia is embarrassed because Alice doesn't know who it is. Um, When they leave the restaurant, Alice leaves her Blackberry on the table and the waitress has to come running out after them to hand her her phone, but Alice doesn't even remember taking her phone out to use it. Hi, kids. Blackberries are phones that used (laughs) to exist with keypads on them and business people would like never be caught dead without their Blackberry. Mm -hmm. So for her to leave it at the restaurant is a big deal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Next, fast forward and Alice is out for a run. Okay. She's a runner. She she believes in run. She is strong. Right. Kari, can you describe her running history? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Running is is like therapy for her. It helps her to clear her mind. Any runner can understand this. Um, whatever issues she she's carrying, she can put it all into her run. And usually she ends that run with clarity of mind. So when things are fuzzy or, you know, stuff is going on, she's like time for a run. She's a runner. She is track star. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So when Alice usually finished running, she's not home yet. She's almost home. She finished running and then she walks the rest of the way home. But she actually gets to the point in her run where she stops running and is about to walk home. But she can't remember the way home. Okay, pause. Has this ever happened to you where you are in a location where you should know your surroundings, but for some reason you can't remember which way is what? I feel like I've been in that situation before. Not that not that I didn't know where I was. Just maybe I got a little disoriented about which way to go. Can I tell you that I lived my first 22 years in around the same few blocks in Milwaukee. But when I became a driver at 16 and I was tasked with arriving to people's homes that I've known my entire life, I had no idea where anyone lived. If I couldn't walk to your house, I had no idea where you lived. And I would be I would pass the same library I've seen my entire life, the same bodega corner store, the same defunct club, the main (laughs) event over on (laughs) Atkinson. Still looking for you for somebody's house that I've known my entire life because I've never physically driven there. I didn't know how to get there. Yeah, I think that's different. That's orienting to driving. I remember when I first moved here, I hadn't oriented to direction yet, right? So I would go down into the, um, on the platform 
all right at for the, the train station yeah. for mm-hmm. the train station and for a couple of weeks i would say days because i was going down to work every day i would Every once in a while, I would get on the wrong train. And one time I texted you and I told you that. And you seemed like so disappointed Disgusted. in the test. <laughs> and I'm like, this is part of the experience. I have to orient myself to where I'm at. And until I can do that, I'm going to make some mistakes. And that's OK. It, they're not OK. So can I tell you, maybe I don't know how to get around the city I grew up in, but Chicago and New York are cities based on grids. Chicago does you the favor of always being west of the lake. It will even alphabetize some streets for you. You should never get lost. We should talk about this offline because now I'm angry again. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it was OK because I was still orienting myself to the city and it was but- part of my experience that's <laughs> what i'm gonna say i didn't feel bad about hopping on the wrong train because you, you could should. get off at the next one <laughs> and get back on and go the right direction no love time. was lost <laughs> okay Kari, let's move on <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay so she was disoriented so that really concerned her she did figure come out of her disorientation figure out which way to go. And she did arrive home. And this was described really well because her heart is beating from the run. Um, But then she like crosses the street and suddenly has no idea where she is on a route that she runs all the time. So then her heart starts beating fast and she's like, no, no, um, that's adrenaline. That's not me panicking but it's totally her panicking. Um, So this was described really well. And then in a second, she knows everything. She knows where she is and how to get Mm -hmm. home. So just like it left, it came back again with no explanation. That's you on the train. (laughs) I'm worried. No, it's not. It's, it's come go get your stuff and come move in with us. It was inevitable. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So next month, November, 2003. Alice visits her doctor and she tells her that she's been having memory problems, that she's attributed to symptoms of menopause. The doctor asked, what kind of things are you forgetting? She said, well, um, names, words and conversation where I put my Blackberry, why something is on the to do list. Um, She mentioned that she became disoriented at Harvard Square. And, and that is an area that's very familiar to her. She acknowledged that she stopped getting her period six months ago, but it came back last month. Um, so the doctor says that these associated physical symptoms are, yeah, they're definitely part of that menopausal stage. They were consistent with that. She did ask her some additional questions. And Alice asked, Can estrogen replacement be used to help with memory issues? But the doctor says they don't use estrogen replacement like that anymore. And that instead, um, they're going to take some additional tests just to make sure everything is okay. And it'll be about five to six weeks, I think, before she could get the results. Late in the afternoon, as she was leaving um, to go to or preparing to go to an annual meeting in Chicago, um, she had plenty to accomplish before she was leaving. She was looking over her to do list. She started reviewing her lecture notes because she's also a teacher at Harvard. Um, And she checked her email and she saw an email from Eric. And that was someone that was awaiting slight contributions for a presentation that is part of this conference that they were going to be at on Thursday. She had looked at her to do list earlier last month and she wasn't sure who Eric was and what she needed to do for Eric or which Eric it was. And so she gets this phone call where they're like, hey, um, we're still wait. I think it was an email. I'm sorry. It was an email. And it's like, we're still waiting for your contribution. Can you get it to us at least by today so he can prepare for the lecture? When she arrives to class, she doesn't remember the topic that she's supposed to teach. And she asked the student, the student. You know how mad I would be if a professor showed up and asked me what topic you sp- I'm supposed to. <laughs> Martin, all the episodes of Martin, you said you was going to talk about <laughs> it and related to um, our uh, th- the thoughts. 
It's a test <laughs> question. Hey, what? Yeah, is everybody so, ready today? I'm what ready. What are we I talking study. about? <laughs> what are we talking about today? Okay, let's Actually, start. you said you wouldn't go ask no questions today. We was just going to talk about our feelings. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm with it. I study for that, too. <laughs> that evening when Alice arrives home, John, her husband, looks confused and asks, aren't you supposed to be in Chicago? Don't. Yeah, so Alice missed the conference in Chicago. When Alice's blood work came back, she decided she needed to see a neurologist because all the test results came back um, normal. And the doctor's like, well, we could just watch you. But Alice was like, nope, I'm going to see a neurologist. I need that. December 2003. So every year they have like a holiday party at, Eric and Marjorie's house. And I think Eric is like the, is Eric the Dean? I'm not completely sure, but I think he is a high level person within the school. So he hosts this holiday party for the entire psychology uh, department. And Alice loves her, I'm going to say team, her department of people. She feels like they're, um, they're family and they share life events together. So her colleagues are like a family to her. So at this party, John was talking to Eric and Marjorie, the host. And then Dan, which is her graduate student, arrived and introduced his new wife. She's in a floral length red dress. Alice is drinking a glass of wine. It's half full. And she engages with them, meets them the new wife and then she heads up to the bathroom and as she's walking to the bathroom she's kind of looking at pictures along the way and she finishes her wine after she's in the bathroom she heads back down to the kitchen pours herself another glass of wine and she's listening to the wives talk in the kitchen she fills her glass of wine again, leaves the kitchen, goes back into the living room, and she sees John and Dan and a woman in a red dress. Alice introduces herself to the woman after making eye contact, saying, I don't believe we've met. The woman looks nervously at Dan and says, I'm Beth. Alice says, do you work for Marty? The woman says, I'm Dan's wife. Alice is like, so nice to meet you. Congratulations. So this is done really well because this book is written in third person. So it's not said I meet Dan's wife and then I go drink wine and tour the house and come back and ask. It's um, Alice walks up to the woman in red. And as Mm -hmm. a reader, you're like, oh, that's Dan's wife. And then Alice goes do I know you? (laughs) And you go, Alice, that's Dan's wife in your mind, you know? And there are a few points like this where you are made to be a close, like family member, a friend of Alice, or, or even you feel like Alice right away through the writing, even though it's third person, really well done. Yeah. And so I thought this part was interesting because when they originally described Beth, they said she was in a long floral red dress. But when they repeated the description, when Alice meets her again, she said they say she's in a red dress. Red dress. So yeah. for me, there is a kind of a hint that maybe it's a different person, but it's the same person. And this is done a few times throughout the book where mm-hmm. um, John will say something and then the narrator goes, And because Alice knew she thought this and you're like, wait a second. No, John was the one who thought this Mm -hmm. and it's never corrected. It's brilliant. It's really well done. Yeah. So the men look at each other and Beth is looking like, uh, so they're essentially feeling like Alice has had too much to drink. John says, why don't we leave? Let's go. I got to get up early. So they leave. So three days before Christmas, Alice is sitting in the mental disorders unit. Um, She's noticed everybody in the waiting room is in pairs. And then she's called to see the doctor. Now, this is the neurologist. Um, Alice mentions again that she's been having lots of problems remembering and it doesn't feel normal to her. The doctor asks what types of things I'm forgetting words. I'm forgetting lectures. I'm forgetting in mid conversation. And she's visiting him of her own accord. 
Yeah. She just she just senses that something is wrong. She it never comes to her mind that, oh yeah, I met Dan's wife twice, or you know, mm-hmm. this and that. She's never connecting these dots. She just feels that something's wrong and she should go see a neurologist. And she's still being very secretive about the problems she's having. Yeah. And she um she mentions that she completely forgets this conference that in Chicago and she forgot where she was, of course, in Harvard Square. Um, and she's a professor at Harvard. So and she said it's been going on since September. The doctor told her that since she was having these memory memory issues, that she needed to make sure that every time she came to his office, she needed to bring somebody else with her because her memory is not the most reliable based on what she's just said. So if you had brought John, he could have perhaps said, oh, yeah. And the issue with Dan's wife. Yeah. You don't even know that happened, you know? Right. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. the doctor does a med check, asks a series of questions, ask about her father. We learned that her father died of liver failure, cirrhosis. The previous year, he was 71. The doctor um, asked about his health. Um, and Alice is like, he's been a drinker forever. I mean, and I didn't really see him in the final years. He didn't really recognize me. Um, so the doctor gave her an advanced screening, uh, a mental screening, s- similar to the one I gave you last week, Kari. Do you remember? I do. Yeah. I said, oh, this is the trick Alexis tried to pull on me. <laughs> and this is a screening that the same screening comes up throughout the book. And as yeah. I'm forgetting the answers, I'm getting more and more worried. Thanks, yeah. Alexis. <laughs> so they ask her, if you remember, readers, I gave Kari the three names and she had to remember them about two minutes later. I don't know if we had enough time. But anyway, Alice is given three names um, and she's asked them again and she doesn't quite remember them. So again, she's sent for more tests and asked to come back in four to five weeks. So it's Christmas Eve. The family's together. Um, Lydia's coming up, or excuse me, Lydia's yeah, Lydia's coming in town. Anna, the oldest daughter, is here, and Alice wants to talk about John paying for classes. Eh, he don't want to talk about it. He's like, "Look, right. I did. I'm sorry. I didn't tell you. Okay, this happened." We don't agree on a lot of things related to our daughter. Okay. But I'm going to pull. He's really dismissive. Her. Yeah. And Hold his on. thing is we supported the other two. So what? We don't support Lydia because she's not doing what we would do. Right. But he should talk to his wife before spending any money. And Alice should like calm down and live her own life. So they both wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> Alice is preparing dinner in the kitchen. Lydia is speaking endlessly about her passion and her craft. And Anna's in the other room asking where the bottle opener is. Alice Alice is trying to remember words and um she's having this conversation. So in Alice's mind, there is a lot going on right now. And she's trying to think about ingredients for bread pudding or white chocolate bread pudding. And it's just not all coming together. So she gets a bit frustrated. She and this can't... is a recipe she's been making her entire life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so frustrated that she can't recall what's required. Alice starts throwing eggs, throwing eggs and breaking them, throwing them. In the kitchen. So I believe it's Lydia that comes in and she said, like, hey, what's going on? And she said, oh, the um, the eggs is expired. OK, <laughs> and we're not having no bread pudding. And Lydia's like, oh, man, it's Christmas Eve. We got to have bread pudding. And she said, well, we're not. And, Al- <laughs> and Lydia says, well, I'll go and buy the eggs and we can make the- and I'll make the bread pudding. OK, why don't you go sit down and relax a few minutes later? Lydia comes in with her coat and is like, how many eggs do I need? <laughs> so the question is still <laughs> out there. Yeah. January 2004. It's January 19th. Not a favorite day of Anna's. She feels like, excuse me, not a favorite day of Alice's. She feels like she always gets bad news on this day. This is the day that she learned, or this is the day her mother and sister died. 
Um, so she really wanted to cancel this appointment. However, the next appointment wouldn't be available for four weeks and she really wanted to keep it. She had multiple neurological tests that morning and these tests were familiar to her. She knew they were um, designed to tease out any subtle weaknesses in the integrity of language fluency, recent memory and reasoning processes. And she'd even taken them before as the control within the study. So when Alice sat before the doctor, she knew she was in trouble. Um, She felt like she had done a good job, but the doctor reminded her, I told you to bring somebody with you. So Alice was like, oh, yeah, I'll do that next time. Yeah, I ain't gonna do that. Oh, yeah. No, I'll totally do that, doc. So it's interesting that he starts with that Mm -hmm. because she just wants to know, you know, how's my brain doing? He's like, next time. So he's saying next time. Mm -hmm. that's not good bring someone with you and she's like oh this this isn't good yeah so the test results are normal though but what he did see is that she had recent memory impairment that was out of proportion to her age and there was a significant decline in their previous levels of functioning and that is based on her account she couldn't retrieve the address when she was last there when they did the um, mini cognitive test. And one of the cognitive tests that she'd taken before she sat down with him, she fell into the 60 percentile for recent memory. And so she fit the criteria for having probable Alzheimer's disease. And it's probable. So when she heard probable, she was like, oof, so it's not real. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I still got some things. However, The word probable was used only because a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's is determined by examining the histology of brain tissue, which requires either a biopsy or an autopsy. So you got to be dead, dead for them to know for sure. So this is as good as you're going to get alive. Yeah. (sighs) And so to see... um, changes in the brain that wouldn't happen until much later stages of the disease. So she had early onset Alzheimer's and 10% of people with early onset are under the age of 65. And usually when it's an early onset, a strong genetic link is a reason. And so they're going to treat her with some drugs and those drugs are supposed to help slow the process. And then he asked her to come back in six months and, of course, bring her husband. He also gave her the name of a social worker so um, for support and resources. And he gave her this list of activities for daily living form, which her informant or John, her husband, would have to fill out. Um, she looked at her bookcase and she was like, There's so many books I wanted to read. And she thinks about all that she wanted to do. So Alice was um, looking at that list and she was about to Google and look for some information. And then John walked in and she knew that she wasn't quite ready to tell John. When she finally did tell John, he, of course, was in denial. He said she was likely depressed, maybe menopausal, maybe not taking care of herself. Um, She reminded him, though, that she had missed that conference and she had been preparing for that conference all day. And she told him she couldn't um, make the bread pudding at Christmas because she didn't know how. She told him she was standing in Harvard Square and didn't know how to get home. Those are things that she remembered. But she'd be terrified to know the things that she didn't remember. And John said, Dan's wife. He remembered. Yeah, that situation at the party. And this is um, also detailed very well, because had she been a man, her symptoms, had she gotten checked out earlier, would not have been attributed to menopausal symptoms. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they would have been seen as early onset Alzheimer's and maybe some medication could have at least bought her more time. Um, But because she even attributed it to menopause, menopause, um, you know, this forgetfulness and this um, absence of memory. So, yeah. And John's like, no, 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 no. Well, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, but John himself, um, as a biologist, wanted to talk to her neurologist, wanted to do his own research. So, of course, he did that. February 2004, John wanted Alice to see a genetic counselor. He counselor. He wanted her to be screened for Alzheimer's mutations. And that he felt like would confirm. And his hope was that it would say, nope, you don't even have that. They're looking for two mutations. Not having them is not proof that you don't have early onset Alzheimer's, but having them is definitive proof that you do. Yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah, it's sticky. So there they are sitting at the um, with the genetic counselor. The counselor, again, as Kyra just said, it kind of explains what the results would mean or not mean. The counselor then asks questions about Alice's family history. She describes her father as a lifelong alcoholic. She didn't think he'd recognized her for the last several years. And those um, things started to happen in his early 50s. But she always contributed the, attributed them to his drinking um, problems. Of course, John was still convinced that he she did not have it. So at the follow up point appointment, the counselor revealed that she did have the mutation that identified her as having early onset Alzheimer's course they want to know what this means for the children um john wants to know what the lab's um false positive rate is what the name of the lab is like double check your records yeah he's doing his due diligence but the lab actually has a 99 percent um accuracy rate when it comes to this particular genetic mutation so for the children it means that Each child has a 50% chance of having the disease. On the way home, Alice was waiting for John to say something, but he didn't. He instead cried the whole way home. Hmm. March 2004. John saw Alice opening her pill dispenser. Um, He turned and walked away. He just, he's not coping well with this. He is in denial. She could hear him going back and forth for something. And you remember like at the beginning of the book, she could hear him looking for something. Looking looking for his glasses. And now he's like, I'm looking for something, but I ain't going to tell you what I'm looking for because you're an invalid. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yeah. I might be crazy, but choose an invalid. Yeah. So Alice um, at this point is feeling like I want to spend more time with my husband. So now they start walking to work together again, but they really can't walk to work together because of the setup. You know, you might get hit by a car or ice. So they got to walk in a single file. So they stop at the coffee shop. And in the um, in the past, John um, did his normal, which is a coffee and a scone. And Alice would get her normal. But instead, she said she wanted the same as John. And John was like, well, um, you don't even drink coffee. So Alice said, yes, I do. (laughs) John said, she'll have tea with lemon. Alice says, no, I don't want tea. I want the coffee and the scone just like you. Okay. The barista's like, okay, I'm going to give you two coffees, two scones. When Alice received the coffee, she tasted it. Of course, Uh, it was. This is disgusting. (laughs) This coffee? I don't like this. (laughs) <laughs> John was like, how's the coffee? She said, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Best coffee I've had today. <laughs> well, I was That's right, back. Alice. You give him a hard time telling you what you know and don't. <laughs> she, when she got back to her office, she threw that coffee away so fast. It was <laughs> so disgusting. She said, you know, this smell is so wonderful. How could the coffee be so bad? <laughs> Then she received a phone call. And so she's looking at her email. She sees an email from Anna and she's like, "Okay, let me just um, get ready to respond to Anna. But then she gets uh, a phone call. So she's on the phone. She's like, oh, I'm about to respond to your email. And the caller says, well, I didn't send you the email. She's like, yes, you did. Here I says this and the other. She's like, "Uh, I'm Lydia. Okay. I'm your youngest daughter, not your oldest daughter. Thanks for forgetting me again, mom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so Lydia called to let her know that she had been cast in a play and that she wanted her to come. And after Lydia finished speaking, Alice knew that it was her turn to speak. 
But because Lydia wasn't in front of her, she just didn't have the visual cues needed to kind of follow the conversation. So comprehension was truly suffering for her. And because Alice didn't respond quickly, Lydia, of course, I'm not going to say, of course, but Lydia got offended. (laughs) She felt like, if you don't want to do it, just say that. I should have called dad anyway. Yeah. And Lydia kind of hung up. And so... She was about to say that if John could get away because she knew she was having issues, she couldn't she didn't really want to fly across country without By him herself. Yeah. But she couldn't speak quick enough um, to respond in a way that um, explained Lydia. what she was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So fast forward. It's April 2004. Um, Her and John have talked about it. Um, They want to come up with a long term plan, but they felt like there's too many things that they need to know and um, too many things that are missing um, for them to make real decisions. Um, So the goal was to for her to finish the semester, avoid travel whenever possible and then spend the summer at their home in the Cape. Right. And then they would agree to tell no one, but they would tell the children. So it's Easter. They come together as a family. They haven't been together as a family in a long time on for Easter. Um, so it was, you know, a big deal for them to get together. And Alice tells the children that she has Alzheimer's. And of course, the children want to know, did you get a second opinion? Did you have a genetic test? So the questions are coming at her. Uh, What is this going to mean for me? How is this going to affect my baby? Alice wants to get pregnant. So she's very concerned about that. And wants to get pregnant. And Mm -hmm. wants to get pregnant. So she's very concerned about her, um, her baby and it having that. So everybody has that 50% chance that they could get Alzheimer's. And so the children decide, need to decide whether or not they're going to be tested. Uh, the two oldest decide they want to be tested, but Lydia, the Anne. youngest, yeah, Lydia says that she does not want to know. The children also ask about clinical trials, um, what's available, and John is researching that now. John and Tom, both being biologists, have that kind of deep science information that they want to connect into to try to figure out what's going on. And if it's really true, does she still really have Alzheimer's? The children are like, well, you seem perfectly fine. Okay. I mean, I, mm, is there really something wrong with you? I wouldn't even know. But Lydia said, that's the youngest. She said, I knew not that you had Alzheimer's, but that something was wrong. Like sometimes you don't make sense on the phone. You repeat yourself a lot. You don't remember something I said five minutes ago and you didn't know how to put the pudding together at Christmas. And John, the husband says, well, how long have you noticed this? And Lydia says, well, at least a year now. Mm -hmm. And then we learn that the children go, Tom and Anna, the two oldest, go and get tested. Tom doesn't have the mutation and Anna does. The one that's trying to get pregnant has Yeah, it. the one that's trying to get pregnant. So as Alice is really still trying to wrap her head fully around what this would mean for her family, she decides she wants to go check out a living, um, assisted living home. And the one she checks out is nearly a hundred thousand dollars a year. So she felt like she needed a better option. And she began to feel like, well, if I had cancer, people wouldn't feel so bad for me. And well, they would feel bad for me, but they, they wouldn't, wouldn't avoid shun me. me. Yeah. 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 So she yeah, expected to be treated as an outcast. She wanted to um, live long enough to hold Anna's, ba- Anna's baby and know that it was her grandchild. She wanted to see Lydia act in something that she was proud of. She wanted to see Tom fall in love and she wanted to have a sabbatical year with John. She wanted to read her to be read books before she could no longer read. But nowhere in her list of things that she thought of that she wanted to do was her linguistics, was teaching, nor was Harvard there. So she really 
using the time you have left for the yeah. things you love the most. Mm-hmm. And, and she, that's interesting because she had dedicated her life to um, not just the pursuit of education, but as an instructor, a professor at Harvard. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. when she was faced with this deadline, all she cared about was her family and her friends and the people and the books. Yeah, <laughs> she, and the books. She could have and read. The books. Yeah. yeah. She wanted more um, 70, degree, 70 degree days and she wanted ice creams. And she said when the burden of the disease succeeded the ice cream, she wanted to die. And she realized that her future self would be incapable of executing this plan. So Alice felt like she needed help. And she knew that she wouldn't ask her family members to assist with anything like that. So she committed herself to a a plan. Um, So she typed a note and she said to herself, Alice, answer the following questions. What month is it? Where do you live? Where is your office? What is Anna's birthday? How many children do you have? And so she gave wrote down the answers to these questions and there would be like a check-in for herself. And she says, if you have trouble answering any of these, go to the file named Butterfly on your computer and follow the instructions there immediately. And she set herself a daily reminder to test herself. One day, Alice goes to school. She goes to class, takes a seat, but um, nothing has started by the time she's gotten there so she feels like okay I'm early (laughs) she took a aisle seat four rows back other students came in she looks at her watch it's 10.05 okay the teacher's late that's unusual she looks at her syllabus skims her notes from the last class she even made a to-do list for the rest of her day she knows she needed to go to lab seminar run study for finals and the students were like stirring uncomfortable in their seats, mm-hmm. looking at her, looking at each other. Like, is she mm-hmm. is she wasting my time? Is she wasting <laughs> our time? And one of the <laughs> students is like, well, maybe it's a guest lecturer. So Alice looks at her syllabus and is like, it ain't no guest lecturer on the list. So, so then they have this 20 minute time period. So at 20 minutes after the hour, the teacher went there. You could walk out. You know, the class is officially canceled. So Alice left. 20 minutes after t- after she's like, <laughs> you're not going to be wasting my time. I have better things to do. So this is wild because she turns to the students behind her. And she's like, I don't know about you guys, but I got other things to do. And so <laughs> I mean, you got to have a sense of humor, right? Like you as do. a student, you waiting for the class to start. The instructor sitting right in front of you. Waste your time for 20 minutes. Then get up and go. <laughs> I got other things to do. <laughs> And they're like, Alice is brilliant, but she wild. She is she a wild <laughs> bull. She is wild. <laughs> Fast forward to June 2004 and they're at the doctor's office. And um, Alice goes back to her regular annual physician that she sees for her regular checkups. And she tells her that she's having difficulty sleeping Um And the doctor offers Alice something that she could take once a day and that that'll help her sleep at least six hours. But Alice says she wanted something stronger. The doctor says, well, why don't we talk to about this when your husband is present? And she was like, that ain't none of my husband's business. I ain't depressed Mm. and I'm not desperate. I know what I'm asking for. I would like a prescription so I can sleep better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Or forever. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So the doctor writes the (laughs) prescription. There's also um, more visit with the uh, neurologist. And at one of the tests they give her is asking her to retell the story, uh, uh, retell a story. And Alice is unable to retell the story. The doctor um, Alice tells the doctor that she's not having episodes of disorientation. But she did have an experience where she forgot what time of day it was. And she mentioned that she went to her office thinking it was morning and didn't realize it was the middle of the night until she returned home. And John was surprised to hear this. He was like, why am I just now hearing it? And she was like, well, because she was sleeping. And he was like, well, when did it happen? Um, You know, last month. And How she, scary must that be for him? Like you was wandering the streets in your nightgown mm-hmm. and I was fast asleep. 
Yeah. And so the doctor tells John that this kind of confusion and night wandering is normal. You might want to attach something to the door so that you know something will wake you up. You also might want to register her with the Alzheimer's Association, get her a bracelet with a personal code so that she knows um, so that, you know, or if she's out, she can be identified or um, when she leaves, you can hear. Uh, He also suggested that John run with Alice. Now, John hates running, but he agreed to do this. (laughs) He also asked Alice if she was able to meet her professional responsibilities at school. And Alice felt like she did pretty good. (laughs) Alice don't know. Yeah. The doctor suggested that um, she make a plan for telling Harvard and transitioning out of her job. Um, Of course, advanced directives, power of attorney, living will, organ donation, all of that. Um, But John's comments was that she was glued to her BlackBerry, almost out of compulsion. And that was hard for him to watch. Her mood and personality were the same, but she seemed a little more defensive and and quieter because she doesn't initiate conversations as much as she used to. And that's because, as Alice said, it's harder to comprehend things when people are not and not in front of her. And then also when people are talking, she's not keeping up with the conversation. (laughs) <laughs> so um, John tells the doctor that he's fine, even though the doctor suggests that he gets some um, caregiver Helps. support. Yeah. yeah, he should need that as well. So, again, let's jump back to the test. As I mentioned, this uh, mini cognitive test. But of course, these are professionals in the book. So they're giving the Alice an extensive cognitive test to test her. OK, her memory kind of those basics. And the test includes these words, John Black, 42 West Street, Brighton. And he also asked her to draw a clock. Alice does a good job, but there was a little confusion in the drawing of the clock. He told her, make sure it's it's a analog clock, not a digital clock. Just like with me last week, she drew a digital clock and he was like, "Mm -mm, you crazy. Mm -mm. Just like Alexis did with me. (laughs) And if she was like, well, you draw the clock and I'll tell you what time it's say. And I was like, thank you, Alice. (laughs) That's what Alice Mm -hmm. said. But it's like, no, ma'am, I I need you to draw it because I'm testing. I'm the doctor here. John (laughs) wants to discuss possible trials um, for Alice to help with Alzheimer's and there is some trials available and Alice feels confident that she can make a decision about what she wants so she selects a trial in which there is a placebo and an actual drug so that's what they're going to do okay I'm going to jump to July 2004 when they're away at the at the Cape where are they at Kari Cape Cod. They're at their, um, yeah, they're at their vacation home. Okay, their vacation. You know, these are home. wealthy professors. You know. Yeah. Okay. So mm-hmm. Alice finds John. They're at their Cape. They're at their vacation home. Alice finds John outside. She knew that he was leaving for a conference, so she was like, "When are you leaving for the conference?" He said, "I'm leaving on Monday. Lydia's coming on Sunday." John says, "Are you ready to run?" Alice is like, "Yeah, I'm just going to grab another layer." And so there's this kind of back and forth where Alice is kind of forgetting mid stage what she needs to be doing. She ends up going to sit down and um, reading a book. <laughs> then she gets then John walks up on her and is like, hey, I, I thought we was going for a run. Oh, yeah, yeah, we are going for a run. I'm going to go to the bathroom first. She heads to the bathroom, but she can't find it. Every room when she opens the door is not the room she expects it to be. How terrifying in your own home, you open the bathroom door and it's the kitchen. You open the kitchen door and it's a bedroom. And you're like, where is the bathroom in my own home? What is wrong with me? She placed her empty glass on the counter next to the sink and dropped the blanket and book on the slip covered chair and a half in the living room. She stood ready to move, but her legs needed further instruction. What did she come in here for? She retraced her steps, blanket and book, glass on counter, porch with John. He was leaving soon to attend the International Conference on Alzheimer's Disease. Sunday, maybe? She'd have to ask him to be sure. They were about to go for a run. It was a little cold out. She came in here for a fleece. No? 
that wasn't it. She was already wearing one. Just as she reached the front door, an urgent pressure in her bladder announced itself and she remembered that she really had to pee. She hastened back down the hall and opened the door to the bathroom, only to her utter disbelief, it wasn't the bathroom. A broom, mop, bucket, vacuum cleaner, stool, toolbox, light bulbs, flashlights, bleach, the utility closet. She looked further down the hall, the kitchen to the left, the living room to the right, and that was it. There was a half bath on this floor, wasn't there? There had to be. It was right here, but it wasn't. She hurried to the kitchen, but found only one door and it led to the back porch. She raced to the living room, but of course there wasn't a bathroom off the living room. She rushed back to the hallway and held the doorknob. Please God, please God, please God. She swung the door open like an illusionist, revealing her most mystifying trick, but the bathroom didn't magically reappear. How can I be lost in my own home? She thought about bolting upstairs to the full bath, but she was strangely struck and dumbfounded in the twilight zone like bathroomless dimension of the first floor. She was unable to hold it in any longer. She had an ethereal sense of observing herself, this poor, unfamiliar woman crying in the hallway. It didn't sound like the somewhat guarded cry of an adult woman. It was the scared, defeated, and unrestrained crying of a small child. Her tears weren't all she wasn't able to contain any longer. John burst through the front door just in time to witness the urine streaming down her right leg, soaking her sweatpants, sock, and sneakers. Don't look at me. Allie, don't cry. It's okay. I don't, I don't know where I am. It's okay. You're right here. I'm lost. You're not lost, Allie. You're with me. He held her and rocked her slightly side to side, soothing her as she'd seen him calm their children after innumerable physical injuries and social injustices. I couldn't find the bathroom. It's okay. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. It's okay. Come on, let's get you changed. Day's already heating up. You need something lighter anyway. September 2004. The dean of her department um, has course evaluations. He wants to talk to Alice about them. The dean says there's been some complaints. Your evaluations were lower, lower than they have been in the past. Some of the students are complaining. They're saying that you skip over huge sections of the outline and then expect us to know it for the exam. You don't know what you're teaching. Um, class has been a waste of time. I could have read the textbook. Um, Once she came to class and didn't teach, she just sat down for a few minutes and left. And then one time she taught the exact same lecture that she had before. So Alice tells the dean that she has Alzheimer's and she was diagnosed in January. She did have a hard time teaching, but she didn't realize how much it showed. The dean is like, well, I want to respect your timeline. I was really thinking it was like your husband was cheating on you. I didn't expect it to be this big. Um, But I would like to offer you an opportunity to go on a medical leave and then you can jump right into your sabbatical year. Um, But stopping teaching is probably the best thing. We don't want you traveling. But Alice had already stopped traveling. Alice wasn't ready to leave, but she also wasn't going to fight about it because she wanted to be the best she could be. And she knew at this point she wasn't. So um, she agreed to take that leave and that she would notify the her colleagues. And she did that on September 17th, wrote her colleagues a letter, let them know that she would not be teaching anymore, but that she would attend uh, lunch seminars and participate in, I think she had a, I'm not sure what you call it, but she was helping somebody. She was an advisor to a uh, graduate student. So one of the first meetings that she attends after she's given her notice that she's no longer teaching is a lunch seminar. And Alice gives the same feedback twice. So she's she's not looking good now in front of her colleagues. 
Yeah, she gives this feedback and everyone at the table is like, wow, yeah, thanks, Alice. They don't know her disease. So uh, for her, this is telling her that I still have value. My mind is not completely gone. I've provided feedback that everyone was delighted to receive. And then moments pass and she forgot she gave the feedback and she gives it again and everyone's awkward about it. Yeah. So Alice disease, again, it progresses. It seems to be progressing um, quicker. And the doctor's like, well, that could be because, you know, she she could have been further along than Mm -hmm. she was when she originally told it. And everybody just everybody around her brushed it off as normal stress or something else, which is not uncommon to happen in life. Right. Mm -hmm. It gets brushed off as something else before we take things seriously. So they talk about the decline of her disease. She's not remembering. She starts not to remember her youngest daughter as much. Um, She's often referred to as that, that girl Actri- the or the actress the actress yes she's the referred actress to is sitting in our living room i want to be near her yeah and she- it's sweet because she has a lot of love for her youngest daughter even though her youngest daughter didn't realize it yeah and so their relationship kind of developed over the course of this disease right. because she lydia became more compassionate to me it seemed a bit more compassionate about the disease and um, whereas Anne is thinking first about her and her future children mm-hmm. which you know is still a valid concern but her daughter her youngest daughter lydia is more of an empath and she's she's asking things like how do you feel mom i'm sorry this is happening to you that sounds exhausting i hate to hear you have to go through that you know, the, those type of things. Yeah. That's from her youngest daughter. By June 2005, Alice had lost the ability to read the keyboard letters and even compose words. Um, she even gotten to the point where she had saw her butterfly notice. If you recall, she set herself up um, with the daily reminders. If you don't remember this, do this. Well, she did that. She got to her butterfly message Um there was a couple of times where she was a bit confused in there, but she got to that message about the butterfly. She goes up the stairs to try to follow through on it. Uh, she forgets why she's up there. And then she's looking for something in a drawer and John walks in. And he's like, here, take these pills. So she takes the pills and she's feeling all accomplished and she gets in bed and goes to sleep. But it was her regular daily pills. Yeah. So um, this was really re- well done to mm-hmm. add urgency to Alice's path. So we have here a note that she's getting every day from her past self, um, directing her on how to take her own life. Mm -hmm. And so she follows it, she reads it and she's like, I wrote this. This is amazing. Cause it says things in it. Like, um, these are your children. This is what they're about. This is your husband. If you can't remember these important things, you must listen to your past self and you must take your own life. And she's like, okay. And so she goes to take her life and she's like, now, why am I in here? <laughs> yes. mm, oh, well. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, yay, Alice. <laughs> yeah. You're going to make it another day. Alice um, is around long enough to see her grandchildren born, but she doesn't quite place them. It takes a second for her to know that it is her daughter and her grandchildren. And eventually she calls them the baby in the pink and the baby in the blue or something like that. And the mom and the actress. And the mom and the actress. So her, she declines, but they only show the point to her decline where the book only tells her decline to the point where she's sitting with John at their summer home. And she barely remembers. She calls John the man that owns the house. Um, But they get to a point where John is telling her that she wrote, they wrote a book together and that they love each other. So the book doesn't end with her death. It does end, though, with her really not remembering um, her loved ones. I was going to say, and in the epilogue, she's surrounded by these grandchildren. All she wanted before they were born was to be able to smell them. She wanted to remember the smell of her grandbabies. And although she doesn't remember feeling that way as she's holding them, she's smelling them (laughs) and they're playing. And Mm -hmm. she's like, these kids smell wonderful. And the actress is so kind to me. And it's a (laughs) 
it's a really um, like poignant po- um, point because um, her daughter, Lydia, presents like a piece from um, an, yes. a place she's working on. And she's like, Mom, I just want you to tell me what I'm trying to convey in this scene. Mm-hmm. And so she acts out the scene and her mother looks at her and says, it's about love. It's love. And uh, the actress hugs her and said, yes, Mom, you got it right. And it's brilliant. Let's take a quick break. All right, let's do it. And we're back. All right. Yes. So what is your final verdict and would you recommend that book? Still, Alice by Lisa Genova does a great job at not just um, trying to convey to its reader what a um, sufferer of Alzheimer's disease goes through, but what everyone around them goes through. And we didn't have enough time to touch on John's passion Mm -hmm. for his job. That's his number one love in life. He gets an opportunity and he's caught at a crossroad. Do I help my wife who is deteriorating by staying where we are or do I pursue this passion because I'm still healthy? And do I drag her along and make her come, even if that means she'll forget things quicker? And he makes his decision. And then um, the kids who each have their role in the family must now change roles to fit the new, um, not obstacle, but this new challenge that everyone is faced with. And they, for the most part, do it with gusto. They really do um, prove to be there for their mom in a very realistic and beautiful way. Mm-hmm. So I will say that still Alice is a very um, concise story. It's not a very long book, but its subject matter is so heavy. It's so heartbreaking. And yet I didn't cry once. Mm-hmm. I was just awed by how this author put me in Alice's brain from the first page. Yeah. From the first page, I was Alice and I didn't close the book and feel so overcome with, you know, how some books you read and you like, well, it's like my whole family died. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd I read that? Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't feel that way. And this is a story that why not tell it? It should be told and we should talk about it because it's something that so many people go through. What, like over um, 5% of the population get early onset Alzheimer's, right? 10%. Something, 10%. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's a lot of people. And this woman woke up one day a brilliant professor and then went to bed a patient of Alzheimer's and didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I really thought this story helped me to remember how important each day is, how much um, we should, how much effort we should place in loving on people we love. And um, yeah, it was a great book. I've used brilliant like 20 times, but it's really brilliantly done. Obviously, a scientist wrote it, you know, and it kind of hurts my heart that she didn't know none. She she wasn't a novelist, but she had a great brain and she could become she was a scientist who could write a great book. But a novelist could never be just a scientist. And I'm like, "Mm, I don't know. It just makes me think I don't have any talents. But this isn't about me. (laughs) Yes, I would recommend this book. Really well done. What about you, Alexis? Would you recommend Still Alice by Lisa Genova? Yes, I would definitely recommend this book. I was drawn in immediately. Like you said, you feel like you're in Alice's shoes. I'm walking this experience with her. I mean, the dress thing. I was with Alice. I was like, who is this new lady? (laughs) Yeah, Alice, if you say we ain't never met her, then we must not have never met her. And we like coffee, Mm -hmm. too. So except we don't. (laughs) So I was all in that experience with her. I really love how Lisa did um, created this book for us and put us right in there, gave us all the fine details, put us in those tests. I love seeing the um, the cognitive assessments throughout the book and you could see each one. Her how, decline. Yes, you could see her decline. Um, and and it, mine too, because I wasn't remembering <laughs> none of it. <laughs> That's what I was going to say next. Yeah, because I'm like, wait a minute, I don't remember that either. But mm-hmm. nonetheless, it kind of opens your mind to Alzheimer's, dementia, mm-hmm. um, the of the umbrella of it all. And it just really made me want to know more. I would love to read another book by um, 
Lisa, Lisa, yeah. as well as uh, dig into this book again. I, I really miss reading books. My time has had me so pressed that I've only been listening to them, but I want to read pages on words on a page. So yes, definitely recommend this book. Yeah. And this is a great book to read a physical copy of because it doesn't feel overwhelming. Um, it is a very economically composed story. And the font is like a good, decent size, you know, it's, <laughs> and you then can you go could, through the pages pretty quickly. And you could go back and look at uh, her original responses to the question and see the decline. Yes, yes. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Alexis. And thank you for choosing this book. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Please tell us what we're reading next week. Death on a Nile. That's right by Agatha Christie. Well, thank you all for listening to Lit Society. We'll see you next Thursday. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Anaria and Kari Herrera. (laughs) Support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Spotify. That's right. You can leave a five-star review for us on Spotify. And on Apple, you can leave a five-star review along with a comment about why you absolutely love us. We love you. We love y'all too. If you've enjoyed what you just heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, read read something. something.